Hey, seventh graders, it's Mr. Eller here again with another one of your flip lessons. Today we're going to be working on um, the James Madison presidency. So this is going to be page number 86 in your, inter or, let's see, five, six, page number 87 in your interactive notebook. Um, same thing, going to be in a little window pane action. Just make sure you're taking your notes in the uh, blank spots. And here we go. All right, so James Madison was somebody we should know. Um, he was, he's been around. He was part of the uh, Declaration of Independence. He's part of the writing of the um, Constitution. Remember, we talked about him being the father of the Constitution because he took such great notes. Um, and he was a member of James Madison's uh, presidential cabinet. He was Secretary of State for, for Jefferson's full term. Uh, Secretary of State means he dealt with foreign countries, helped Jefferson deal with issues with foreign countries. So he was pretty influential in the Louisiana Purchase. He was pretty influential in the Embargo Act, dealing with Britain and France and all their obnoxiousness and all that stuff. So Madison had both a pretty good awareness of how the Constitution worked because he was there, but he also had a very keen awareness of foreign issues, which was going to be a big issue during throughout his presidency. Madison was a Democratic Republican. He easily won the election of 1808. Uh, he won by 70, he won with 70% of the Electoral College. Um, today we consider kind of anything over 55 to 60% as being a pretty big victory. So that was an absolute crush job um, over the Federalist candidate, Charles Pickney. Um, and then Madison was uh, voted into a second term in 1812. Both of these elections kind of showed that the the country was swaying more towards the Democratic Republicans and led to a long-term uh, Democratic Republicans holding the office of the president. So this should be a reoccurring theme for all of our presidents so far. Washington handled it. Adams had to handle it, Jefferson had to handle it, and Madison kind of had to handle it. But really, did those presidents really handle it? To this point, presidents have tried to remain neutral, meaning we were going to stay out of, out of the way. But the problem kept happening, and it got particularly bad during Madison's, um, Madison's term in office. Britain and France are still attacking our, over, our trade ships overseas. But what really sent it over the edge is this issue of impressment. Now, this isn't impressment like, ooh, wow, look at that thing. It's so cool. I'm so impressed. This is impressment like we're forcing you to do something. Britain began to take over American ships and basically give American sailors a choice. Become part of the British Navy or pretty much die because you're not in the middle of the ocean and we're going to kind of kick you overboard and, you know, you may think, oh, I will take my chances and I can swim to shore. You're not swimming to shore thousands and hun or hundreds or thousands of miles away. A mile-long swim is, is pretty difficult, particularly in the ocean with the waves. So this was getting particularly bad um, during from about 1808 to about 18, 18, 10, 11, 12, so two or three years. Also what Britain was starting to do was Britain was starting to arm Native Americans in the frontier, so those... Ohio, Illinois, some of that area that was kind of around, not the area that was gained by the Louisiana Purchase, but right before that into parts of Kentucky, Illinois, um, Ohio, etc., Indiana, and arming those Native American groups in their attacks um, began to attack American settlements and forts along the frontier. So what Madison was basically saying is, yes, we're remaining neutral, but it's Britain who's pretty much doing these acts of war um, by impressing our soldiers and arming arming our enemies to help attack us. So this leads to what is going to be called the War of 1812, and it's always a, one of my favorite uh, wars to talk about. We'll spend a little bit of time on it this year. Um, but it's my favorite because a lot of it happens in, in and around New York State, particularly if you've ever been to the Thousand Islands or the Great Lakes or anywhere in that region. Madison is going to become the first president to ask Congress to declare war on Britain. Remember, Congress, as our checks and balances system, has to pass a war declaration. The president can ask that to happen, and once, the, once Congress has officially declared war through a vote, then it's the president's job to take over as commander-in-chief. But he's the first president to ask Congress to declare war on Britain in 1812, Hence, the name of the War of 1812 should be a question we always get right. When was the War of 1812? 
well, technically it was 1812 to 1814, but you get the idea. So in his statement, he's going to issue um, his reasons why. And there was another issue that started to come up. Britain started to blockade American ports. So what blockade means is basically you're not letting anybody out. You're not letting anybody in. So British warships were stopping American ships, either leaving American ports or coming to American ports. They were still impressing American soldiers, and they were supporting Native Americans. And this is what Madison outlined. Now, within the vote, this is going to be an issue, again, with our political parties and the development of political parties. It was almost a strict border or a strict um, party line vote for this. Zero. Zero Federalists in Congress, either in the House of Representatives or the Senate, voted for the war. None at all. It was only passed by Democratic Republicans, and there was virtually no support for the war in the New England states. Why was there no support of the war in New England states? New England states were vastly, vastly um, connected to England through trade. That was their number one trading partner, and go all the way back to the colonial times, what were the federal or what were the New England colonies doing? They were trading. They're continuing this trade. That's where most of our manufacturing hubs were, um, our mills and things like that. So that that was going to carry over into um, why. And you know, New England was mostly Federalist, so not a lot of support to the point where some of the New England states thought it would be a good idea to secede or leave the country and form their own country in the. 1813-1814. So the War of 1812 happens and a couple things are really apparent. Number one, America is not ready for war. We don't really have a standing army. Congress has not funded a standing army. We have an army. We have a navy, but they're not really well trained. They're not, it was peacetime, so we weren't really having um, a lot of training sessions and things like that to make the, this army ready. Just like the American Revolution, what's the first thing that the Americans do? They feel like we're going to invade Canada. Canada is going to join us. They feel like invading Canada is going to lead to more acquisition of land. The Canadians are not going to fight us. They're going to join us and, and for their freedom. And da, 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 da. doesn't happen. Same idea. We get about as north as Quebec. We lose at the Walled City, and we have to come back. August 1814, Britain captures Washington, D.C. and burns it to the ground, including the White House. Um, James Madison narrowly escapes. The only thing that was saved was a portrait of George Washington. It was saved by President, uh, President Madison's wife, Dolly, which still is in the, um, in the White House. The Battle of Baltimore, um, Francis Scott Key was in the Fort William McHenry. Uh, the battle actually inspired him to write what was going to become the national anthem. And then the other big thing about the, the War of 1812 is its most important battle oddly happened after the war was declared over. So Britain and England, or Britain and America quickly realized this war was getting them absolutely nowhere. They decided to stop. Um, word of the Treaty of Ghent does not reach, reach America for at, until after the Battle of New Orleans. But at the Battle of New Orleans, America is going to gain a key strategic victory. They're going to be led by Andrew Jackson. Remember that name. He's going to be pretty important later. Um, and it was kind of a very, he was, he was undermanned. He was overmatched. But through some strategic advances and things like that and using the geography of the city, he was able to defeat, um, defeat the British. All right, that concludes our flip lesson for today. Um, if you have any questions on anything, as always, hit me up on Schoology. If it's something directed right to me, if it's something your uh, fellow classmates can help you out on, just put a message on the update board on um, Schoology. Till next time, seventh graders, out.